Hello, my name is Mark Manassi. If you don't know me, I'm a tech journalist, consultant, teacher, and speaker. One of my favorite things to talk about is Microsoft's very versatile command shell called PowerShell, and that's today's topic. The bulk of this was recorded live in early September 2013 via a webinar hosted by my friends at LearnIt.com. They're a technical education company based out of San Francisco with locations around the country, and they not only paid to make this webinar possible, they provided John Roby, the producer, whom you'll occasionally hear break in with a question from the audience. They are at L-E-A-R-N-I-T dot com. And again, let me thank them for kindly making this possible. Since PCs first appeared, I've made a living by teaching people how to manage them with an eye to getting that management done as simply and quickly as is possible. To me, one of the best ways to accomplish that simply and quickly is through automation, where automation could be something as basic as some ugly command line tool that ain't pretty but avoids a thousand mouse clicks, or it might be as complex as a VB script talking to Active Directory or WMI, Windows Management Instrumentation. So what's different about PowerShell? Well, in all honesty, getting admins to buy into automation tools is difficult because, well, there's an understandable fear of the command line among many techies. And more important, command line administration has always been largely optional. I know lots of smart techs who almost never venture into the black screen. With PowerShell, however, things have changed. With Windows Server 2012 and Windows 8.1, it's essentially impossible to administer a pile of desktops, servers, and the networks that connect them without at least knowing some PowerShell. And it is an absolute fact that you will miss out on much of what you paid for with those operating systems without what I'd call an advanced beginner's facility with PowerShell. In short, I'm not here to sell you PowerShell today. I'm here to help you keep your job. I'm guessing that if you're listening to this, then you already have some feeling for what PowerShell is, but you're skeptical or maybe downright hostile, and don't worry, I won't take that personally, to learning PowerShell. In the next hour, I hope to do a few things. First, I'll do a bit of simple advocacy. Yes, PowerShell is a set of command line tools like ones you've seen before. And yes, I freely admit that all the stuff about syntax and pipelines and when do I use a capital T or does this command need a lowercase t can be a major pain when you're looking at a CLI, command line interface. But I'm going to explain that PowerShell is fundamentally different than its command line predecessors. I'll talk about why other CLIs have failed and why this one will succeed. Then I'll explain PowerShell's basic structure. As you'll see, there's a strong regularity to PowerShell, a sameness of look and feel amongst PowerShell commands, or as PowerShell calls them, commandlets. That means I'm only exaggerating a bit when I say learn one commandlet and you're 90% of the way to knowing them all. That will next enable me to show you a variety of commandlets, stuff that does many different things in just a few minutes. And that will lead us to some very simple but useful automation examples. I'll then talk about a few cases where PowerShell enabled me to very quickly build a custom solution to some naughty problem. Finally, I'll do a plug about the Server 2012 and PowerShell classes that I'll be teaching this fall in Atlanta, New York, Seattle, and San Francisco in the hopes that some of you will come join me. So let's get started. And so my first big chunk is called Why Learn PowerShell? And by the way, I'm told that the way this software works is that when I push the button and go to the next slide, takes about four seconds for it to get up on your screen. So I'm going to try to remember that when I see an opening screen, that I've got to wait four seconds before you guys can read it. This is an easy one. There's only a one, two, three uh, words on it. But for the next one, well, in a few words, here's kind of what I see as the big history. This is the, the overall, Mark's overall total theory of everything when it comes to PowerShell. So if we go back to the beginning of computers, Essentially, computers started out as all, I guess what we'd call, command line interface. Yeah, I know it wasn't always command lines. And I see those of you out there with the, the ponytails, with the gray hair, and the shiny spot on top. Yeah, I, I get that. Originally, it was cards and stuff like that. But I'm saying, basically, once people started sitting down and interacting with computers on terminals, it was just keyboards, right? No mice. As a matter of fact, the guy who invented the mice, uh, the mouse, uh, uh, Mr. Engelbart, just, lo just left us about two months ago. But in those days... What was really important about this, and I got started in the early 70s with computers, what was really important about it was, first of all, no one said administrator, they said sysop, and no one said developer, they said programmer. But what was interesting was the line between a sysop 
and a, and a programmer. Between an admin and a dev was a lot fuzzier. I mean, there really wasn't a developer that couldn't turn a computer on, uh, add a hard drive, stuff like that. Similarly, there wasn't a sysop that didn't know some COBOL, didn't know some Fortran. And if we were running overall, over, excuse me, if we were running overnight batch jobs, you know, it wasn't all that unusual that if, if you'd committed some syntax error that was going to cost you a day's work, that the sysop would see that, see the, see the, the fix, and rerun the job. It really makes me sad that we've now, and I think it's because GUIs came along, but, you know, because GUIs came along, uh, what, in 1984, the Macintosh comes out, and that's the first big successful GUI. Microsoft decides that they're going to get on the GUI bandwagon. They have to do that. And that was great. But the problem was they went overboard with it. Because let's be clear, command line stuff, normal humans, your grandma doesn't need to know command line stuff. But unfortunately, if you joined the Windows game in, I don't know, 89, 90, 91, you could have been doing this for, what, 20 plus years. But you could be forgiven. I mean, I have friends that are considerably younger than me who, who are admin experts, super geniuses in the Windows world. When it comes to command line stuff, they're like, you could tell they're uncomfortable. And that's because, I mean, for a long time, the only administration you could do was GUI. And that was just plain goofy. Let's be clear. I love GUIs. GUIs are great. But when it comes to automation, you can't put mouse clicks in a batch file. And so I think that's what's hurt, what's hurt us, is that for a long time, Windows didn't have a lot of command line tools. as a few everybody knew. But other than that, it was sort of a, you know, it was a very, very optional thing. And that gets me back to that point that it, it troubles me that we've, we've gotten to a world where we've tribed up. Okay, the users always got pushed off to the side, unfortunately, because there's so many of them and because they have certain needs. But I mean, here we have two very large technical populations in the in the in our world. Uh, one are developers, and the the people that build the tools as well as the the applications. And then there's us admin guys that keep things together. But so many administrative tools again require some kind of repetitive stuff, require some autom some aut automation. And I'm going to say more than 99% of us never pick up an automation tool. VB script, everybody knows about it, but I don't know a lot of people that actually do it. They've dabbled with it a little bit. Maybe they'll copy a VB script from somebody else, but we don't do enough of it. It's not considered a necessary thing. And I think things are changing. The ground underneath us is shaking. And whether there were PowerShell or not, we need some kind of automation tool, which is why I'm excited that PowerShell's here. I mean, GUIs are great, but they don't lend themselves to automation. Command line interfaces do. But I mean, I see you shaking your heads. Most command line stuff is horrible in terms of figuring out how to make it work, in terms of their silos. Every command line tool you learn is a, sil is a silo. You learn nothing. When you learn one command line tool, you learn nothing about how to, how to learn the next one. Now, PowerShell is a command line tool, but I think it's unique in that it retains automation friendliness, so it's powerful, but it also does what GUIs do. With a GUI, when you learn one program, once you've learned solitaire, you get, you're immediately, immediately smart about Notepad. PowerShell is like that, too. So you get something that's easy to learn. It gives you the benefits of automation. And, oh, by the way, Microsoft has made it essentially required. So we kind of have to learn it. And that leads me into this slide is why you have to learn PowerShell. So this slide is why you have to learn PowerShell. The next slide is why you're going to like it. So there's really three reasons. This is the bad news. The reason that you have to know it. First of all, this is a first-class administrative platform as far as Microsoft is concerned. This has been something that the Microsoft product groups have had pushed at them for almost a decade now. And many have pushed back. I mean, there's still some hunks of Server 2012 where we don't have very good PowerShell support. But they're the minority. They are definitely the, the minority. Uh, and it's a funny thing you see in the Microsoft world. And if there are any Exchange administrators out there, you can raise your hands. And Exchange administrators, you know, because you were the first ones that really embraced. The Exchange team was the first ones that really embraced PowerShell. And that was great. But the downside was once a product group gets the fever, so to speak, they kind of go overboard, and there's some things as an exchange administrator in 2010 or 2013 that you really have to be a little bit of a PowerShell person to do. We had a similar thing happen in the discipline that I do. I've been an MVP. I've given, been, been given the MVP award in directory services for 11 years running, which is a great honor, and I'm, I'm, I'm very, you know, I'm flattered to have it. But when Active Directory came out for R2, so 2008 R2 now, that was the first time we got good PowerShell support, and that was great. But the goofy thing was certain things could only work with PowerShell. For example, 
uh, the Active Directory Recycle Bin, a terrific new tool that allowed us to, to unkill deleted stuff. Well, the, the Microsoft guys went a little nuts, and they didn't just give us this great new tool in PowerShell and the GUI. They gave it to us just in PowerShell. So that's the second reason, that sometimes once a group gets the fever, whatever it is you work with, whether it's SharePoint, whether it's SQL, whether it's whatever, sometimes once PowerShell arrives, it sort of says, well, not only am I great and automatable, you got to learn for some basic stuff. I'll give you another example. If any of you are moving file servers from 2003 or 2008 to 2008 R2 or 2020, uh, to 2012, or perhaps 2012 R2 for all I know, there's a lot involved in doing that. Well, Jeff Snover, the guy who invented PowerShell, his team said, and this is quite a while ago, they said, let's make life easier for people. And if you Google, or maybe even Bing, that might work this time, an overview of migration commandlets, you'll find that I want to say there's about 12, not many of them, there's a handful of PowerShell commandlets that are not in the box. You can download them and install them, and they will make your life easier in trying to move file server chunks over. Uh, excuse me, uh, migrate file servers from one physical machine to another physical machine or perhaps to a virtual machine. So first reason is a big push. Microsoft, you know, you're, they're really showing you more and more PowerShell examples. And I imagine if you're taking the tests, you're going to get asked more and more PowerShell questions. The second reason is sometimes it's the only way. And the third time, th the third case, is sometimes you're going to want to do it. Because sometimes the PowerShell, and by the way, if you're looking at that slide, you see I've written POSH. POSH is the official uh, short way of saying PowerShell. In many places, the POSH tools are far, far better than the, the GUI tools. I mean, for example, there's a great thing in 2012 called DHCP failover. It's a dirt cheap DHCP cluster. Very cool, very nice. You get this nice configuration GUI. You, you set up a whole bunch of migration criteria. Excuse me, you set up a whole bunch of... of uh, Failover criteria for this cluster, push the button, and I hope you got it right because you can never get that GUI page back. I don't know why, but if you want to change that stuff, that's right. It's a, it's a PowerShell command or commandlet, rather, that's going to do that for you. Um, another example, storage spaces, which is Microsoft's SAN stuff. There, It's part of Server 2012. People don't realize this, but Server 2012 is essentially just one thing. It is a finely designed and honed, constructed, and assembled, and assembled missile pointed straight at VMware. Well, part of its payload module is storage spaces. It's a SAN-like thing. It's very interesting stuff. In the right application, it makes a tremendous amount of sense. Very useful tool. But man, if you don't know PowerShell, you are so missing out. If you want to create something called a virtual disk, those of you who have done storage may know LUN, logical unit number. The GUI gives you, it's easy, but you're missing out on 60% of the options. Another example, I use Office 365. Because it's so awesome. No, I use 365 because it's cheap and I didn't feel like running my Exchange server anymore. Anyway, when I first got Office 365, it wanted me to change my password every, I don't know, three days or something like that. And it was driving me crazy. And so I looked around on how to do it and I finally found it in the GUI. But it was, man, it was like hidden downstairs and, you know, under the sign that says, beware of the cheetah, you know, uh, you got to push the cobwebs away. Turned out that there's a bunch of PowerShell commandlets that you can download that will let you control stuff like your password policies in Office 365. I've got a newsletter on that on my site if you've not seen it, and it's just awesome, wonderful. I assume everybody here knows me, but if not, my name is Mark Manassi, M-I-N-A-S-I. -S my website is www.minasi.com, and you can find my newsletters there. And one of the recent ones is changing your password policy with the PowerShell tools, which is absolutely fantastic. So that was sort of like why you have to do it. I mean, next I want to talk about why I think you're going to like it. And I know, I know, you've heard this all before. <laughs> you've heard. Essentially, when I talk to people about command line stuff, it always feels like I'm saying, I know it's spinach, but it's good for you. And uh, there is an element of that. <laughs> Let's be clear. Learning PowerShell is tougher than learning the GUI, but it's, you know, everything you learn has a learning curve. The first time you sat down to a GUI, I always say that GUIs are intuitive once someone explains them to you. And when I say that, what I mean is nobody ever sat down at Windows for the first time and figured out double click or click and drag or double click and drag. I, you don't come up with that stuff. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying that you, you do have to be taken by the hand a little bit. And at that point, you're over the learning curve and you get some stuff done immediately. My point, though, is that the next step, command line, I'm going to talk about that 
in the uh, next couple of slides. But with command line, you feel like there's this huge learning curve with every command. With PowerShell, there's a huge learning curve with the first command. And afterwards, you're really smart. But I think the reason you're going to like it is that I don't know about you, but I, I've always found getting to command line tools to be harder than it really, really ought to be. Um, I, as I think I want to say 17 years ago, I've been writing for Windows IT Pro Magazine for that long. I think it's that long. And our editor at the time, Dina Baird, got a bunch of us together at a conference and said, okay, guys, you know, what should we be writing about? And I said, you know, it'd be cool. There was this thing at the time called the Resource Kit. You may remember that. And it was a bunch of programs that people at Microsoft had cobbled together, not official, not officially supported, but some of them were very powerful. If you're a RoboCopy fan, and if you're not, well, you don't copy files. RoboCopy came out of that, that, uh, that original stable. I said, you know, it'd be really cool if we had like a one-page column in every magazine that said, ever had this problem? Wouldn't, you, wouldn't it be cool if there were a tool that could do this? Well, there is. It's named this, and this is what the syntax looks like, and don't run away. That looks really scary. Here's a worked out example. And so Dina said, when are you going to start writing? I said, oh, that sounds boring. I don't want to do that. So ultimately, though, I can't say no to Dina. Every month I've been writing this for however long. It is so sad that I can make a small living writing a monthly column about how some command line tool works when it should be evident. It should be prima facie about how to make this thing work. Well, the PowerShell guys are putting me out of business, and I don't have a problem with it at all. And Microsoft speak, Microsoft says that PowerShell is discoverable. That means two things. First of all, it's easy to find the command that gets your job done. And the second one is once you have found it, it's easy to get help on it. Because, I mean, help's wonderful, but i got to know what the tool is before I, before I start look at downloading the instruction manual. So Microsoft says discoverable, or they say it has discoverability. You know, there's 411,000 words in the English language, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, but Microsoft feels the need to keep adding them. Anyway, I'd say regular and predictable. That's what's nice about this. And give me a couple of slides, and I think I can prove that. But the basic concept is that PowerShell commands, I think of them, they're called commandlets, by the way. And uh, Jeff called them, Jeff Snover, called them commandlets for two reasons. One, the phrase C-M-D-L-E-T isn't used anywhere else. So if you Google, or as Jeff once explained this to me, if you Bing, he works for Microsoft, if you Google or Bing, Commandlet. You only get PowerShell stuff. Now, I'm going to tell you not to Google PowerShell too much. Give me a second on that. The second thing is, PowerShell is essentially, think of it this way. This is a big thing to understand. The command line stuff we know runs on cmd.exe. That's, that, that's the black screen, right? You've ever heard that? The, the hackers work in the black screen. And, you know, C colon greater than, uh, uh, C, C colon backslash greater than sign. And those commands are sitting on top of a platform called Win32. I mean, think of a stack. There's the computer's hardware. Above the hardware is the device drivers that lets the software talk to it. Then there's the operating system itself, Windows. Above that, there's the, the tools, the hooks that programmers can use to build programs. That's called Win32. But, and Win32 is great. There's 600,000 things it can do. But it's hard to write some programs. And so about 10 years ago, actually 11, Microsoft built another layer on top of it called .NET. That's another programmer interface. But that has a bunch of pre-built programs, much more powerful stuff that's so-called object-oriented. But what it means is all object-oriented means is less work for programmers. It's a trade-off we've been doing with computers since computers began. We build operating systems that are operating systems and programmer tools that are essentially bigger that slow down the computer more and more. So our computers, our, our software gets bigger and slower, but it's easier for programmers to write it. That's the trade-off. Hardware keeps getting cheaper, programmers keep getting more expensive. So that's a trade-off we've made, and it's a good trade-off, because if we make life, life easier for programmers, they'll make better tools for us. Anyway, .NET is a platform that a lot of apps sit on. Well, that's cmd.exe that you know, that's, that's a command line interface that sits right on top of the Windows API, the Windows Win32 API. The PowerShell command, prompt, though, that sits on top of .NET. I'm simplifying a bit when I say that. But the point is that when Jeff designed PowerShell, it was not only a command line tool, but a command line tool that could exploit the power and simplicity for programming and automating that programmers have with .NET. So it's a .NET command prompt. Think of it that way. So um, commandlets are things that essentially 
are command line tools that have been built maybe on top of 132, but oftentimes built on something in .NET called a .NET class. And Jeff showed me that if you have a .NET class that you want to expose as a commandlet so that us administrator types can use it, it's a small amount of code. So commandlets, it's, an, it's a unique name, and two, it, they're fairly short if you're a coder to build. And my story about don't Googling, uh, my story about don't, about don't Google PowerShell too much, when you're trying to solve a problem, use the help, because the help is good, first of all. And second of all, we have, we've had three PowerShells, PowerShell 1, 2, and 3, and 4 is on the way. PowerShell is so cool that when people start using it, they want to start blogging about it. And that means if you, if you Google a question with PowerShell, you may get an answer, but it's a PowerShell 1 answer. Nothing wrong with that, but you're missing out, out on the power of PowerShell 2, PowerShell 3, and the so-called desired state configuration PowerShell 4, which is a story for another day, but it's kind of interesting. If it works, it basically means that you just sit down and describe what you want the network to look like, push the button, and PowerShell does it for you. Sound impossible? Well, we'll have to stay tuned. Anyway, the beauty of PowerShell commandlets is that not only are they kind of chunky pieces built on top of .NET, which is pretty high-level stuff, but also you can glue them together and kind of like Legos and do your own automation. You can often get the power of scripting without a script. That's cool. It also means that when you do have to do a bit of non-trivial scripting, it's so much easier than VBScript, C Sharp, or whatever. And I'll, I'll get to the the point that I made about silos in, in just a moment. Sidebar, why do I like CLIs? Three big reasons. Even a dope like me can build a so-called tool. Get some command line tools you know, stick them in Notepad, save them with the CMD extension or the BAT extension. You've just built a program. We've been able to do that since 1982. I love that. Uh, can I program? Sure, a little bit, not really. You know, uh, me building anything is a bit like anyone trying to build a nuonic circuit out of stone knives and bear skins. I just, um, I'm not ready for it. Second is command lines don't change as quickly as GUIs do. I have come across new versions of Windows that drive me crazy. Vista, I wanted to make my laptop into a Frisbee the first time I was trying to create a user account. Ah, using the GUI. And it seems like every version of Windows has this little tool in it called, I call it, the Windows Administrator Scavenger Hunt, where they move everything in the control panel to wherever else. Command lines, my friends. Do not, do not surrender to fads. I'm using command line commands I learned 25 years ago. So this is a cool thing. I mean, I, and, and seriously, uh, ask anyone. When we, was, when we started working with the Server 2012 beta, Server 2012 beta, this is ridiculous nonsense you have to do with the mouse in order to turn it off. Everybody I know who knows PowerShell, we all by ourselves came up with the same answer. Keep a PowerShell command prompt open, because there's a lot of things you can do with it anyway, and just type stop dash computer. Don't have to worry about the mouse nonsense. And then, and then third, more options. As I said to you, if you're going to build, for example, a virtual disk, a LUN, in the Microsoft SAN tools, you have way more options with the commandlet than you do with the GUI. So easy to build tools. It keeps you from tearing your hair out because you don't have to go through control panel. You already know that. If you, if you know a CLI to get something done, I guarantee it's still going to work, and you generally have more options with them. Speaking of which, I want to talk a bit about why CLIs suck. I was going to call this slide, When CLIs Suck, you know, like the thrilling Fox animal shows, but the, this became why, why CLIs suck sometimes. First, documentation is often terrible. I told you the PowerShell guys do a much better job. And they're often silos, and when I say that, what I mean is when you learn one, it doesn't help you with the next. Here's some examples. This first one, netch int ip set dns name equals ethernet, addr equals 4.2.2.2. That is a commandlet, excuse me, that's, excuse me, that's a command, that's a command line command that came out with Windows 2000. And does that look familiar to anybody? If it looks familiar to you, that's because you do Cisco iOS, not to be confused with Apple iOS. And Basically, in those days, Cisco and Microsoft were, you know, kind of shacking up, thinking about getting married, and so they started adopting each other's characteristics. And so this netch can't command came out, and the way it works is it kind of builds. Netch means that's the net shell. Let's get in it. Int is short for interface. Oh, we're talking about an interface. Great. Once we've found the interface we're talking about, then we're looking at the IP stack, because there could be another stack. There could be a net buoy stack or an IPX stack, a V6 stack. Then we're going to set the DNS client value. Okay, and then which... Uh, which and, the idea is we're building on all this stuff. And if you think this is a great approach, that's terrific. Uh, it probably because you're a Cisco person and you've, you've developed Stockholm Syndrome when it comes to CLIs. I, I get that. 
So, so if I'm learning this the first time, you say, okay, so the, the reason there's all these words, they're separated by spaces, spaces are important, and we build, we kind of focus with every command, we get closer and closer and closer to what we want. Cool. Now I've got to learn another command, I'll bet everybody knows. IP config space forward slash all. What's that slash? There wasn't a slash last time. Well, that's no problem, Mark. The reason it's got a slash is that DOS command line tools have had slashes since the beginning of time, and that was April, excuse me, August 11th, 1981. Oh, okay. Because it kind of looks that like that all in the IPK fix slash all. It's like it's cowering behind something or something like that. Okay, so sometimes space makes options and it focuses, and sometimes it does slash. Huh. And then there's another command about everybody knows is ping. What if I want to ping something, but not four times, just once? That looks like ping dash minus n or dash n, whatever it is. One, four dot two dot two dot two. Let's pick that one apart. Well, that kind of looks like that first command because we have a lot of spaces, but then that's a dash thing. What's the dash or the minus do? What's ping minus n? Wouldn't ping minus n be pig? This could all get very confusing at this point. Anyway, my point is learning one of these doesn't help you learn any of the others. And that's really where PowerShell is going to make life better. So let's take a look at the PowerShell commandlet structure. Well, all PowerShell commandlets have names that look like verb dash now. Now, the verbs only come from a small number of approved verbs, and I'll talk about that uh, uh, next slide. And that's the beauty of this. If you're going to do, try to do something like, like create something or change something, you soon learn that create and change aren't acceptable verbs. It's going to be new, and it's going to be set. So the first thing is the PowerShell team comes up with a small number of, uh, of acceptable verbs. Then from there, the particular product group that's going to build the commandlets because the PowerShell guys don't go to Active Directory, the Active Directory people, and build the Active Directory commandlets from. They don't do that. They, they explain PowerShell to the coders that are inside the Directory Services team and say, you guys, you might want to build some PowerShell commandlets. And the Directory Services team looks at it, thinks about it, and they come up with their own stuff. The Directory Services team, not the PowerShell team, chooses the nouns. So we'll see a command like new-ad user. So on one side's the verb, the other one's on the noun. That's where the, the name of this presentation comes from. I was at an MVP summit recently, and a friend of mine who's another directory services guy, good guy, and we're talking about 2012 stuff. And I'm always talking about PowerShell. And he says, Mark, stop talking about PowerShell. I said, why? He says, I don't want to learn PowerShell. I said, you have to learn PowerShell. It's verb-noun. It's very simple. Learn-PowerShell. He says, I don't want to learn PowerShell. I said, then you're going to have to leave dash industry, brother, you know? So... Um, so seriously, the point I'm trying to make, or I hope to make, is that this is doable. Let's talk about some nouns. The directory services team decided to make their noun for an Active Directory user, AD user. Thank you very much. They could have called it Active Directory user. That would have been a pain. And how about the Hyper-V guys? Well, the Hyper-V guys needed a noun for a virtual machine because we're creating virtual machines, changing virtual machines, deleting virtual machines. They could have called it V-I-R-T-U-A-L-M-A-C-H-I-N-E. Oh, they didn't. It's VM. Thank you very much. Sometimes it goes crazy. Our, our directory services friends decided that read-only domain controller should be read-only domain controller. And one of the MVPs uh, said, why don't you just say RDC? And they said, well, you know, maybe people don't know what that means. And he said, if I had an AD administrator that didn't know what RODC stood for, I'd fire him. Anyway, Windows services are called service. Running processes are called process. And the nouns are always singular. So it's not AD users. It's not VMs. It's not Active Directory users because the team, the, the directory services team, picked AD user. The exchange team, when they needed a name for mailboxes, they came up with mailbox. That's cool. And why is that useful? Well, in the next slide, I think we can start thinking about how we can start to guess the names of PowerShell commandlets. That's where this is going to start getting useful. So let's talk about the four big posh verbs. I'll mention some others, but these are the big three, big four. New, that always means create. There's no create dash verb. It's new. So, for example, if I wanted to build a virtual machine, what was the noun on that? Well, look back a slide, and the, the noun on that was VM. What's the command that is going to create a virtual machine? New-VM. Okay, good. Uh, what if I wanted to create an Active Directory user? Well, actually, creating users, well, that's, 
that's different and more fun. But to create a user account, that's going to be new dash ad user. The next one is get. Get is my favorite verb because it lets me play around with things. Get is a look, but don't touch command. If you want to think show, list, display, reveal, something like that, use the word get. How could I see all of the services on my system right now, my system services? Remember the noun is service? So it's get-service. Is it get-services? No, it's not get-services because they're, they're never, never plural. But so get-service. What if I want to see all the processes running on me, kind of like a task list? Well, get-service. This is not exactly right, but if I wanted to see all of the Active Directory users in my domain, get dash you guessed it, AD user. It's actually a little different than that, but that'll work. What if I'm sitting in a Hyper-V box and I want to see a list of all of the virtual machines in that, that box? For example, get-VM. Well, what if one of them's named VM1? And I want to find out some specifics about VM1. Get-VM, VM1. I love get because when I've got a new noun, like when I first got those Active Directory commandlets, Oh, man, I was so happy back in 2009 when I first saw those things. I got a hold of the beta, and I just wanted to see what, what they tell me. And I said, huh, there's a thing called get-ad user. Uh, that lets me see the ad users. Cool. What do I get? 110 pieces of information about every user. That's awesome. Hey, wait a minute. What about machine accounts? And I just guessed get-ad computer. And I was right. But you know what? My other guess would have been get-ad machine, and it would have taken me an extra guess. I hope you start to see how how being able to guess the commandlet names, that's the cool stuff because this is why this becomes useful. Again, to kind of tell the story again, if the first Windows command, if the first Windows g game you ever played was Othello or Solitaire, that made it easier for you to learn when, when a word or, or notepad or things like that. In the same way, learning new-ad user, for me, I worked with new-ad user for quite a while because virtual machine support really didn't have PowerShell until 2012. As soon as I got a hold of 2012, I'm just guessing new dash VM and I figured that thing out in like no time at all. So it's the repeatability is bringing to this command line interface something that GUI always had, but the CLI never did. The third verb is set. Set is set could be tweak. You know? Set could be change. If I want to change something about something, it's going to say set. If I want to, I don't know, maybe you have just gotten married, congratulations, or maybe you've just gotten divorced, maybe congratulations, and you want to change your last name in your, your Active Directory account. Well, let's see, you're a what? You're an AD user. I wonder what the command would be to change your last name in AD user. I could take a wild guess, set dash AD user. If I want to change the amount of RAM that a virtual machine has, now, I needed to do that yesterday. I'm putting together a presentation about, uh, uh, about uh, clusters and such for virtual machines. And I was you know, guessing about what command that would do something. And set-vm turned out, of course, to be the tool I was looking for. That's not always true. I mean, for example, to me, changing someone's password should, should be set-ad user. It's not. To me, renaming a virtual machine should be set-vm. It's not. It's rename-vm. But, you know, the basic for... Makes sense most of the time, and you'll start to learn that there's other verbs around the side and some very good discoverability tools. Remove means delete. There's no delete dash whatever. It's remove dash whatever. How would I blow away a virtual machine? Remove dash VM. How would I destroy? How would I delete a user? Remove dash AD user. There's lots of other. Uh, there's a, I'm going to get this wrong. I think there's 100 verbs in total. You see add. That adds things to a list connect, measure, measure is great, measure this object lets us take anything and say how, how many lines were output from that, basic statistics, things like that. Uh, rename, that's another one that we see pretty commonly. Mark, uh, can I cut in for one moment? Please do, John. Uh, what's up? There is a question here from Vaughn Numrick. He wants to know, is there a git-noun? Because it doesn't seem to work like git-verb does. You know, John, Vaughn is a little bit, you know, John, have we met before? Because it's good to have a shill in the audience. Um, I, the next thing I was going to say is that one of the funniest nouns is verb. How can verb be a, be a noun? And if you say get-verb, it will show you the approved verbs. Now, that would make you logically think, wouldn't it, as Vaughn just said, that there ought to be a noun. There isn't, and here's the reason why. 
there's no way for PowerShell to know, at least no easy way for PowerShell to go out and know what all your nouns are. That's not exactly right. I could show you a one-liner that would collect all the nouns on your computer. But there's no way to have a central registry of it. Because, for example, there's a number of non-Microsoft companies that are adopting PowerShell. I'll give you an example. How many of you out there are VMware ESX folks? The VMware guys have stepped up to the plate and produced some really, really nice PowerShell commandlets. So, no, there, there isn't an official noun is not a noun. <laughs> so a verb is a noun, <laughs> and noun is not a noun in this case. That's a great question. Thanks, Paul. I want to give you another example in this next slide of learn once, use many times. So we've looked at new to create, get to look at. And again, I love get because that's the one that lets you explore. You can never hurt things with get. Set lets us tweak or twiddle. Remove lets us destroy or eliminate. Well, there's some other verbs, and one of them is rename. And I want to, I want to give you an example of learn one, of use once, learn many times. Excuse me, learn once, use many times. So the first time I wanted to rename a virtual machine, I'm looking in a set help. It's nothing there. So what I did is I did a command I'll teach you next time called uh, in two, two slides called get dash command. And I said, hey, command, get dash command, tell me all the commands that have to do with VMs. I just say get dash command star dash VM. Show that to you in a minute. And I saw, oh, rename. Huh. So I looked at the help. And here was my example. It said uh, rename dash VM. And I had a, a thing called web VM. So dash name, web VM, that's the existing name, dash new name, in quotes, VM1. So there's the pattern. Rename dash something, dash name, old name, dash new name, and then the new name. Huh, okay. So because I learned that, that meant that when, the, when some of the AD tools and some of the 2012 tools came out, we were able to rename a computer. That meant that I sat down and just for fun, I wanted to see if it would work. I typed rename dash computer dash name and oh I did a bad job here. I should have typed dash name. There is a that's a typo. That should that should say rename dash computer dash name. Anyway, uh, PC24 dash new name accounting PC and it worked just fine. So the PowerShell guys, I mean all the people that are building PowerShell are doing a very, very good job. And is consistency 100 percent No, but it's so much better than what we've seen in so many of the Microsoft uh, tools that have, management tools that have come out. And by the way, you see me typing a lot of stuff with uppercase and lowercase. One of the great things about PowerShell is that it couldn't give a hoot about uppercase or lowercase, and that's one of the things that I absolutely love about it. Uh, another thing is that if these commands are looking long, all the PowerShell can be typed quickly with tab completion. Just type a few letters, hit tab, and it'll cycle. As a matter of fact, if you wanted to, you could even type get dash and hit tab, 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 and it would show you all of the get commands in sequence. And, of course, shift tab takes you back. This next slide is commands look really long. Well. Again, we have tab completion. There's also the notion of an alias, where longer commands can have shorter names. For example, get-command, which I'm going to talk to you about soon, has an alias of GCM. Also, parameters can be shortened. So I, I, I don't have time to explain these all in detail, but basically you can, you can shorten a parameter as much as, as makes sense. So if you have dash name and dash new name, you can't shorten it to dash n, but you could shorten dash name to dash na and dash new name to dash any, enough that it can be distinguished. But seriously, uh, if nothing else, look at tab, and you can become a really fast posher. With that in mind, let's do an exercise. I got some commandlets here. Can you guess anything about these before I say them? And if, even if not, does it make a little bit of sense just from, from these? Let's go through them quickly. Set dash ad user, dash identity mark m. So what is that? You're going to guess. I haven't told you this, but you can probably guess. that This is a set dash 80 user command. It says, let's modify an Active Directory account. Good. Which one? Well, that's the identity. That's Mark M. Dash title instructor. That says, go find my account and set its title to instructor. Now, I will freely admit that you could imagine. You say, wait a minute, Mark. That's a lot of typing just to change somebody's title. Isn't it faster in the GUI? I'd say not because my command prompts open all the time. And set dash a to use. Remember, I'm not typing all that stuff. I'm saying set dash a tab space dash i. And as a matter of fact, identity is unnecessary. Trust me on that. And then I'll get this done far more quickly than wandering around an Active Directory Administrative Center. Get dash a to user. What's that going to do? Well, even if I hadn't told you, it's, it doesn't hurt anything. It just reveals something. So get dash a to user and then filter. Filter is going to say, show me a subset of the users that meet a criterion. The filter is then in curly braces. That's something we're going to see again in PowerShell. 
curly braces. Filter enabled dash EQ. That's the way PowerShell, PowerShell says equals dollar sign false. Dollar sign false is a built-in value that means not true. All right, let's go back. And, that, that is a little weird, but let's go back and look at it. Enabled is a characteristic of every user. So if you're disabled, that means that your enabled value is false. If you are enabled, then you, that's true. I know it, it's a little bit like reading a group policy setting sometimes. Let's see. If I set this setting, it disables the null session. So if I enable this setting, that disables the null session, so null sessions are disabled. But if I disable a setting, that disables still disabling, which enables, you know. But so the way this works is we're, this is a way of saying, just give me the people, the accounts that are disabled. There's other ways to do it, too. Add dash printer. Great new commandlet. How many of you have to roll out printers? How many of you have to deploy printers? And you say, I just, if I only had an automated tool. This is a commandlet that, by the way, users can run. You could put this in a user script and bang, the user's got that printer. You're saying, wait a minute, Mark, that drives me crazy. Well, hang on. The user can only do that if the user has access to the print driver and access to whatever the, whatever the resource is. So you can control that with other PowerShell commandlets. But add dash printer, dash connect, whack, whack server three, whack big laser. Nice, easy way to get somebody deployed to a printer. How about this one? Restart dash computer. Yes, it's a little verbose. Some of the PowerShell commands are a bit verbose, but I, do I have to explain anybody, to anybody what this does? Stop dash computer is a similar one. This next one's kind of interesting. You know, when you're, when you're rolling out Windows, if any of you roll out disk, desktops, you know that there's chunks you want to turn off. Maybe you don't want the games rolled out. And how do you go about shutting that stuff off? You could spelunk around in the control panel. There's been a dism command for a while. Well, the dism commands are getting absorbed slowly into the rest of the PowerShell commands. Anyway, so we have a command, disable dash windows optional feature. It looks like disable dash windows optional feature dash feature. And then it's got a magic name like Windows Media Player. So for some reason, you don't want Media's Windows Media Player. That's just a simple example. Maybe it's not one you'll do. You could enable a Windows optional feature like Telnet Client. Don't do that. <laughs> Let's just assume you want to disable Windows Media Player. That's how you get rid of it. Okay. Remember that command. We're coming back to that. Here's another one. Ever had to roll out a VPN connection? How do, you, how do you automate setting up a VPN connection for your users? Well, here's a Windows 8 command. Add dash VPN connection, name, to office, dash server, 4.3.2.1. That's, that's the RS server that you'd be connecting to. You see, that this stuff starts to make sense. And by the way, when I'm typing add dash VPN connection, if I forget it, if I forget that it's dash name, I just say dash. And I just tap tab and it just cycles me through the options and it cycles me through the most likely options actually first. Here's a slightly uglier one, but I think it's pretty powerful. And I think the AD people out there will find it interesting. Search dash AD account dash account inactive. What's that mean? Well, we know, we know what disabled accounts are. We know what locked accounts are. We know what deleted accounts are. Inactive is kind of an unofficial thing. Inactive says, tell me someone who hasn't logged on in X days. Oh, oh, did I get your attention there? Yeah. There's some neat stuff in the AD command. Let's let me say, show me all the folks who haven't logged on in X days. Well, here's one of them. And the directory services team knew that you'd find this exciting, so they built this especially. I mean, you could do this with get-ad user, but it'd be a lot of work. Search-ad account makes it super simple. Search-ad account, dash account inactive, dash date time. And that thing in quotes, 09 slash 3 slash 2012. That could be September 3rd, 2012. That could be 3 September 2012. It's very, very flexible what it'll take. Dash users only. So don't show me some other stuff. That command right there will show me the people who haven't logged on since the 3rd of September 2012. That seems pretty interesting. And then there's a command disable dash account dash identity mark M. That's a standalone command. And you can guess what that would do. I mean, if I say lock dash AD account, is it hard to find out? To figure out what it's doing? Of course not. So the familiarity of the verbs, the relatively small number of nouns. I mean, there's a small number of verbs, but a small number of nouns as well. You probably live most of your life in exchange. There's a small number of exchange nouns. Or maybe you live your life in AD, small number of, of AD nouns, etc. This is how, again, this stuff becomes predictable and to use the Microsoft Word discoverable. And speaking Mark. of this, John, go ahead. 
I've got a couple of syntax questions here, and since they are sort of relevant to that slide, I thought I would interject them now. Um, one, uh, Buddy Harvey wants to know if restart dash computer option, what the restart dash computer options are for networked computers. Uh, so the question for, so if, if I wanted to remotely restart a computer, let's say. So the short answer is, I'm going to guess, but I don't know. And my guess is going to be, in 98% of the commandlets, you say restart dash computer dash computer name, and the name you want to control remotely. So that's probably what it'll be, but the only way to know for sure is just help space restart dash computer dash full, as I'm going to talk about in a moment. Keep going. And we also got one more. Uh, Daniel Wolf says disable dash Windows optional dash feature is not working for him. Do you know of any? Um, He's probably running Windows 7. That, that's my guess. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, a lot of these are going to be Windows 8 commandlets, guys, and, and uh, you're happy to drop me. I'm, by the way, before I forget, if you have longer questions about that and I don't get a chance to answer that stuff, I'm at mark at manassi.com, just M-A-R-K at M-I-N-A-S-I dot com. Happy to take questions on that stuff. Okay, any others, John? There's one more. I'm suspecting this will be a, an OS version uh, thing as well. Um, Ernesto Caro says for the git dash ad user filter should it not be dollar sign underscore dot enabled dash eq dollar false uh that may be it, it actually the technically he's right but the way that some of these commandments have been built is that they're a lot more forgiving in syntax so but yes from a technical point of view um that would be the one that i'd be more likely to show people i just didn't want to have to talk about the pipeline variable here okay great thank you that's all i've got thanks a lot so let's talk about discovering commands. Uh, the get dash command commandlet is the thing that's going to do that. It has a short name of GCM. So let's say that I've told you, for example, that there are printer related commandlets in Windows 8 and in Server 2012. You want to learn out more about them. Well, you can use wildcards. You say get dash command. Now what happens if you, let's back up. What if you were to type get dash command tap enter? It would show you every single command. That would be a lot of typing, but it's a lot of, a lot of output rather. But here we're going to give it something to kind of uh, to, to bite on. So get dash command star printer star. That says give me any command that looks like it's got printer in it. For example, when I first got a hold of R2, 08 R2, and wanted to see all of the Active Directory commandlets, I said GCM, get command, star dash AD star. So I knew that they all look like that. So you can use this to winnow down the things you're looking for very quickly. And it'll show you, we've got new commands include things like install printer. And then from there, if you want to find out more about a command, use the help. Help is a function, not a commandlet, but it works the same. You say help install dash printer space dash examples. And at that point, the cool thing is you get examples and they really work, which is, I know, astounding. Like that should be illegal or something. Anyway, so the, about 90% of the time, the, the examples work. You can alternatively just say dash full, and that's going to give you a lot more information. So. I hope I've kind of gotten a point across the idea that this isn't so terrible. But still is the whole question, all right, I can do this stuff with the GUI. This is really useful. Let's take it a step further. And let's talk about where one of these places would be really exciting. Well, first of all, there's remote control. So remember our command disable dash Windows optional feature dash feature Windows Media Player? What if I want to do that on a remote computer? Well, there's a command that lets you take almost any command and run it remotely. It's invoke dash command. And please read ahead. Read on that screen there, guys. There's three commands. How are they the same? Every one, the command that's called invoke dash command. Great. There's a parameter, dash script block. That's just PowerShell ease for we're going to do some commands. And then in curly braces, it says disable dash Windows optional feature. So we know that one. That's that command that turns off Windows Media Player. So we've got, we're invoking a command. The command is to remove Windows Media Player. Okay, well, what's interesting about it? the stuff in yellow. Computer name, the first time around, I've got lists of three command, uh, three, three PCs, PC3, PC6, and PC99. So the idea here is now I'm saying, uh, this command, I'm not, just remote, I'm not just invoking it locally. I want you to do it on those three machines, and by the way, all at the same time. Well now, wow, huh? You kind of got my attention there, but wait, there's more. The next time, when I say dash computer name, and I want to have a list of PCs. Maybe I don't want to type it in line. Maybe I want to run this command every morning. I'm giving you a silly example. I want to run this command every morning, and the PCs will vary. Well, this is just the type command. You may know it from the command prompt. 
You just, it says take the contents of that file and dump it out right in line. So that means it'll go read that file and insert those names right in line. In the third example, what if I'm feeling really lazy and I want to do it to all of the machines in an organizational unit called kiosks in my domain, bigfirm.com. So here we have again, dash computer name, and in parenthesis this time, get dash 80 computer. Well, guess what that means? And again, I've simplified the syntax a little bit. Okay, I've simplified the syntax just to, to save on space. And dash search base, and that says only search within that particular range. So that's saying, go get all the computers that are in that OU and stuff them in there. That's pretty powerful, right? Just listing more than one machine is pretty nice. Having a file where you've typed them beforehand is even easier. But having the computer go out and find the names that machines that meet certain criteria. We could say, for example, if you populated in your Active Directory accounts your machine accounts, what building they're in, we could say do this to every machine in building 23 by putting a filter in there. So I hope you agree that that's kind of useful stuff. Another great tool is the pipeline. I want to talk just very briefly about the pipeline and give you some examples. And then from there, I'll be able to talk to you about some real-world examples where I've found PowerShell useful. Now, this is in the Unix world. It's been around since I want to say the early mid-80s, I believe, maybe earlier than that. And in, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm wrong. It's, uh, it's certainly the late 70s. In the, in the DOS world, in the command line pre-Windows world, in the Microsoft world, I believe it first appeared in, uh, if I recall correctly, DOS 2, which meant that you could start taking these commands and glue commands together. Well, what does that do for, for us? Well, that up, up and down symbol, that upright bar symbol, that's called the pipeline. It lets us take the output of one command and stuff it into the input of another command. Now, if you've not done this, that doesn't help much. I'm going to give you an example. Now, that's not new. We've had pipelines for a long time. What PowerShell does, though, that, and, and when Jeff first explained PowerShell to me, I'm a little slow, and so it took me a while to get the coolness. But when he made me understand that the data that's coming out of the first command and into the second command isn't text, because it's always just been text, I was like, wow. So it's self-describing data. I said, was this XML? He says, no, it's objects, .NET objects. What that means is if we were, if this were three years ago, five years ago, and I were talking about a bunch of commands we glued together with pipelines, I'd be saying that we send the names of users down, and then the receiving command has to parse them out, and that's no fun because I have written so much parsing code. If I had that time back, I could go on vacation for three weeks, and no one would always be gone, you know? The fact that PowerShell runs objects down the pipeline, and they're not just PowerShell objects. They're SIM and COM objects as well. I haven't the time to explain this in detail, so I'm going to ask you to trust me. I'm doing more writing on this as time goes on. It's so powerful, it's unbelievable. I mean, it's just, in English, it means we can take a commandlet that finds things. Like, what was our commandlet we did before? Find all the users who have not logged on in 90 days. That's the first command. But it's non-destructive. We run that through the pipeline, you know, or, or down, down the, the veal fattening pen, you know, the, the slaughtering cor corridor, into the second command that says, disable AD account. Now, there's a lot there, so I want to explain that with a, a little graphical example, and I want to explain to you, by the way, that I am truly, truly terrible when it comes to building uh, PowerShell animations, excuse me, PowerPoint animations. So if this works, then you know that it's the, week, that the, the work of weeks. <laughs> Seriously, I want to find all, del I, excuse me, in this example, I want to delete all disabled accounts. So I'm going to do that in one line. I'm going to glue together three commands. First command says, get all the AD users, run them down the pipeline. Then run a filter, and the filter will pick out only the, the disabled ones and throw the rest of them away. Roll the disabled users down the pipeline, and then the last piece deletes them. So to get the AD users, that command was get dish AD user. And again, as I think it was Daniel pointed out, that's not the exact command. It's get dish AD user dash filter star, but don't worry about that. Get dish AD user. The next command is going to be where, where's my filter, and the last command is going to be remove AD user. So let's look at this graphically and see if I can make this work. So uh, first is we start from a command, get dash AD user, and that's basically saying all users please. From get dash AD user, that then goes to something called the Active Directory web service, and that in turn goes to Active Directory. Okay. Now 
Active Directory then grabs all of our users. Now, I warned you I'm terrible at animation, really bad at animation. So I got a bunch of these MSN heads, and I took some of them, I turned them on their side, and I put little red X's on their eyes. So those are the disabled users, okay? Disabled means that's a bit in it. doesn't mean they're, like, you know, in wheelchairs. So we're not saying bad things. And so we've got all those users. And so those have now been delivered on over. And uh, I don't know if you got to see the animation over, uh, over this particular meeting software. But anyway, so the users move over there. And we're going to send those users. Get to Shady User is now done. It wants to take its output and send it to the next command. And that next command gets that through a pipeline. So here we're going to build a pipeline from Get to Shady User to the next one. And that then, that's our users sliding right through. Was that impressive or what? And the users slide right through the pipeline to the next command. The next command, first of all, we got to get the, those, those users. And so our, our users slide right in over the pipeline. And where are they going? They're going to a commandlet called where-object, which has two short names. One short name is where, and the other one's just a question mark. Now, where needs two things. It needs some stuff to chew on. That's the users. And it needs to know a criterion. So we've, uh, we've, we've given it that criterion. The criterion says we only want to see the disabled users. So we pop those users in there, and it spits out our disabled users. And I'm hoping I'm not too ahead of you guys because I can't see exactly what you see. Forgive me about that. Now that we've got that small amount of special subset of users, what are we going to do? Well. Where has done its job. We've got another pipeline, and those users are going to slide all the way down that pipeline, and they know that they're really, really, really special. We get our third commandlet. Our third commandlet is to delete, to remove dash ad user. Again, we get a pipeline. Again, our users appear through that pipeline, and they know they're special. And now I said we we're going to reuse, now I said we we're going to remove them with re remove dash ad user. And if you don't know about how R2 worked, well, you're thinking I'm going to do this and drop those users right in the trash can. But in actual fact, we drop them not in a trash can, but into a recycle bin. The point, though, is I hope that this helped show a few things. First of all, get to shade a user is a very general tool. It just gets a whole pile of users. You can put a filter on it, whatever. Where, very general tool. You can use where to pick out files or filters or processes. You can use where to grab certain mailboxes. You can use where to, you know, do just about anything. So the person who built where wasn't thinking about Active Directory. The person who built get dash ad user maybe wasn't thinking about deleting ad users. And then we have remove dash ad user. Again, general purpose tool. You just drop some users in the bin. How much fun would it have been for me to have to go write an application that did that? Not much fun at all. But by spending a little time learning get dash ad user, where object, and remove dash ad user, I saved myself three days. I mean, how many of you have ever had to build a VB script of some kind? For a long time in my consulting, I maybe two, three times a year, possibly, I got to solve a client's problem by cooking up some script. And it's always, man, you know, I do it twice a year. That's exactly the amount of time that I need to forget how to do VB script. So I'm dragging my old VB script up, reloading it in my head and all this stuff. Three days later, lots of prayer. I've got, you know, something cooked up. Now I've got to build a, a test active directory, and maybe it runs on a test active directory. Just a tremendous amount of work. And it's, it's like a, a, I love, you know, the, in the Dos Equis ads, that's the guy who's the most interesting man in the world. There's some great parodies, and one I have, I've seen on the Internet that I love is there's the picture of him from the ad, and the caption is, I don't test my code very much, but when I do, I tested on the produ production network. Anyway, he can do that. We can't. And so, I mean, all this stuff, just all these layers makes me want to not build a VP script again. In contrast, look with me here on my other example. Here's a second one-liner. We, we call them one-liners because we've got three commands, two commands, whatever it is glued together. It disables all accounts that have not logged on in 90 days. Now, we met it before. Search dash 80 account, dash account inactive, dash date time 9-3-2012, dash users only. So if you're thinking about my animation, it got all of our users that meet that criterion. Then we pipe that into disable dash 80 account, and I'm sure you can guess what that does. I mean, first of all, 
Isn't this something you'd like to run every Tuesday at 3 a.m.? I mean, this is something you could easily script, that's scripting, and schedule. I mean, this is a friggin' tool. We have done what would have been 110 lines of mildly scary to write VB script. But wait, there's more. If I haven't convinced you this is interesting yet, how about the fact that all of the dangerous PowerShell commandlets have an option you see on the bottom there? Oops, sorry. Um, and that's the dash what if. So what I could do is I could do my search dash 80 account, blah, 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 all that stuff. And I had dash what if. And all it's going to show me is, had this been an actual one-liner, I would have zapped the following people. That's pretty neat. I think that's just really, really, really pretty neat. Uh, they have another one, by the way, called dash confirm. If when all is said and done, you're still scared of running the commandlet, dash confirm will say it'll run, but every before it handles each victim, it says, are you sure? And that comes in the box. You don't have to do any extra coding or anything like that. You know? People often say to me at this point, this sounds great, Mark, but I can't hand a script to one of my junior administrators. They'd just be frightened. There's a great little free tool put together by the community. I think Quest hosts it, but I'm not sure, uh, called Power GUI. And you could take any script or PowerShell commandlets and wrap a GUI around it. I'm going to tell you about some, some things that I've, I've done with it. I'm, I'm not a PowerShell expert. I'm, I'm just hacking my way through this. I learn it as I need it. But I've come up with PowerShell scripts to do a number of things. Uh, first of all, disable inactive accounts. That seems like a useful little thing, you know? And you know what, if nothing else, one of the things I show you in, in my class is that, that little command that says, tell me the number of people who haven't logged on in X days. Well, let's see. Let's take the output of that. Let's sort the names by how long it's been. Well, now, now we have a report of all the inactive people and how inactive they are. Huh, what if I just emailed that to myself? Well, you can. It's a PowerShell command, send-mail message. I'll show you how to set that up and make it something that runs you know, every Tuesday at 3 a.m. or something along those lines. Another example was to build a better IP config. I've loved IP config for years. First met the thing 21 years ago, but as time goes on, IP config gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then there was that day Vista came out. For the first time, I typed IP config slash all, and it scrolled off the screen. Oh, no. I mean, for years, I've been begging for Microsoft to come out with an IP config forward slash no BS, you know? So I can just like say, I don't want this or I don't want that. Give me an XML file. And then last October, uh, the new server 2012 and Windows 8 betas, had, the RTMs rather, had come out. And I was playing around with them one October morning, one Saturday morning. I'm sure you do that too on Saturday mornings. You've got the command line all fired up there. And then you've got a cup of coffee next to you and you're just playing around. And I, I found this get command and that get command. I'm like, let's see. That one gives me IP addresses. That one gives me DNS suffixes. That one gives me DHCP, and I'm like, wow. Because, you know, my old friend IP config, you know, it's got a little, little, little dottier and a little thicker around the waist like most of us. If only I could bring him back to life. I looked at the outputs of these commandlets, and I, I heard a voice behind me. It says, we, can re we have the technology. We can rebuild them better. And, you know, I had never built a module before last October. I just did a little bit of reading about how to do a module, and inside of three hours, I had built get-ip-info, which to me is a better version of ipconfig. And you can look at my newsletter. So I think it's newsletter 102, and you can see for yourself. So, but it was super easy. I mean, I'm an idiot, and I got this thing working in no time at all. I, uh, another thing I found is that I had downloaded a whole bunch of Delta reminders or Delta stuff in my calendar for a bunch of flights I'll be doing. And I ended up with like 20 events that had reminders. I hate reminders. They annoy me the day before or something like that. I don't want that. And so uh, I want to get rid of them. I said, well, how can I do this? Well, I've done VBA, Visual Basic for Applications, but it's a pain. And Outlook doesn't support PowerShell. Aha, but it does. You see, because Outlook doesn't understand PowerShell objects, but it understands an older kind of object called a com object. And PowerShell has a generic command called new-object that will make a PowerShell object out of any com object. I did a little hacking around with it, and in about two lines of code, I, I wrote one little commandlet that showed me all of the reminders in my Outlook, and I've got dates back to 2008, so the 1700, and it showed me all the stuff that has reminders, and then I had another command that found all the reminders and wiped them right out. As a matter of fact, I had two recurring events 
that somebody put in my calendar in 2010 and through some quirk of outlook could not be deleted for love or money. PowerShell, first time. I'm working on a newsletter on that. I hope to get that out as soon as I possibly can. Speaking of my newsletters, I've got uh, tens of thousands of people on my mailing list, but you know, people's names finish, uh, some people's names change, uh, their, their email address, their, their email addresses change. They don't always update me, and so here I am sending mail to empty addresses. I don't want to do that. I don't want to clutter the internet. So I get normal non-delivery reports. I have a script now, which is a slowly evolving tool for me, that sets things up so that when I do a mailing and I get non-delivery reports, it says, okay, that's an out of office. I don't care about that. That's an FPF, SPF problem. We'll look at that separately. Or, oh, this person doesn't exist anymore. It takes them out of the list automatically. This is all simple stuff that I can do in my spare time. Again, I'm not that smart. If I can do this, you can do this. So in summary, I'm saying that, that PowerShell is worth learning because it's, sometimes it's the only way. It doesn't waste your time. That's what I love about it. The regular naming, the consistency, the examples, the discoverability, the fact that dash renames or rename dashes always work the same. The remoting abilities. See, because the first couple parts like, okay, sometimes the gun's to my head and I've got to do it. Okay, if I'm going to do it, I might as well be more efficient with it. Big deal. But then we kick in the other stuff. The remote control stuff is fantastic. And then automation, simple automation. Get a few commandlets, glue them together. Many times it boils down to find one commandlet that finds all the troubled machines, the troubled users, the, the services that have a problem, the um, the the websites that are that currently not working for some reason, the DNS servers that are not responding. So that's step one, find the problems. Step two, do something. Report on them, disable them, delete them, restart them, whatever. So what would be a script becomes a one-liner. And then, if you want, you take it a little further, you start taking more than one command, you put them in a script, save it with the extension .ps1, and in no time at all, you build in your own tools. Well, I, I said I'd run an hour, so apologies. That was 66 minutes, and I hope it was a good use of your time. But before you go, please permit me to talk very briefly about the classes that I'll be offering this fall on, naturally, PowerShell, as well as classes on Windows Server 2012, 2012R2, and Windows 8.1. For about a year now, I've been presenting a very packed two-day class on Windows Server 2012, where we cover everything new from top to bottom. And I'll be offering that class again in Atlanta in mid-October, New York in early November, and Seattle in early December. On those same weeks and same locations, I'll also offer my one-day introduction to PowerShell. It's a lecture and demo-based class that'll get you to an intermediate level with Posh. In the second week of December in San Francisco, however, I'm going to offer two new classes. First, I'll deliver a two-day hands-on version of my PowerShell class. I'm going to do it at Learn It's downtown San Francisco location. I'll also present a one-day class that will cover all of the changes that Windows 8.1 and Windows Server 2012 R2 bring. If you'd like to attend one or more of those sessions, please visit www.manasi.com, that's again M-I-N-A-S-I.com, to sign up. Thank you for listening. I really hope I got you interested in PowerShell. I'd love to hear what you thought of this presentation and or take any questions that you have, so I invite you to drop me a line at mark at manasi.com. Thanks again, and remember always to use this knowledge for good and not for evil.